The basis for our sermon this morning is taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, verses 60 through 69. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, who do you look to and go to as a source of truth? Who do you turn to for advice because you know that they will tell you what you need to hear, not just what you want to hear? Many people imagine that they have the corner on the truth. You hear all different types of news stations and websites proclaim that they have the source of truth. You have people that think that they are fact checkers and can tell you what is true and what is false, even though fact checkers are also people too. You have any number of podcasts that you can find online or blogs or blogs where people proclaim, I know what the truth is, but the honest truth is this. We cannot trust anyone in the world to give us the truth 100% accurately 100% of the time. Not even those that we love most, who we trust most, can we rely on to always speak the truth and never once be wrong about something. In our text for today, we'll see that there is only one person and one person alone that we can go to who whenever he speaks, we can be absolutely certain that what he speaks is truth and what he speaks to us is life. On hearing it, that is Jesus saying he is the true bread from heaven who gives life and only those who eat him and consume him by faith have life. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus is the most offensive man to ever live because he is the one who proclaims himself to be God, who proclaims himself to have come and die and rise for the sins of the world, and that is exactly what he has done. He is the most offensive man because he proclaims to be God, and he is, and this does not sit well with the sinful nature in the world around us. When the people say to him, in fact, his disciples that at this time had been following him up to two years. Now in the third year of his ministry, when Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life and you must believe in me in order to live, they say, this is a hard teaching. And that word denotes a roughness. It's a harshness. What Jesus says next is harsh. It grates on their ears when he says, the spirit gives life, but the flesh counts for nothing. How could he say this? After all, the people of Israel were a nation that revolved around the flesh. They were a nation that revolved around the covenant of circumcision, which was a sign in the flesh of males that their family was a part of the family of God, that they were God's chosen people. They had the covenant of Abraham. They had the circumcision. It was all about the flesh. What was Jesus talking about? And not only that, they were God's people, his chosen people picked from the face of the earth. They weren't like the rest of the unclean nations around them, the Gentiles. No, they had his law. They had his will. They were good people. They went to the synagogue every single Sabbath. They tried to follow the law of God rigidly and keep every single one of his commands, some of them even keeping made-up commands that they had come up with to show their true piety before God. They could trace back their genealogy all the way to the time of the Babylonian exodus when the people of Israel came out from Babylonian captivity back to the nation of Israel. That was many hundreds of years before this. 
They were the true people of God. They wouldn't mix their blood with the nations around them or fall into their errors and their sins. They were children of Abraham, flesh and blood Jews. Flesh counted for everything. And yet Jesus comes along and calmly and certainly and powerfully tells them, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. Jesus was telling them, you cannot save yourselves. You think you are pious. You think you are righteous. You think you are innocent on your own. And you don't see that you have turned your back on the source of truth and life itself. You are just like your ancestors. He told them time and time again through his ministry because he cared for them and loved them. We're told he wept over the city of Jerusalem because he saw how he was trying to draw them all in. He even says that. He says, nobody can come unless the Father has enabled them. He drew them to himself with kindness and yet time and again his people wanted to turn their back on the truth, wanted to shut their ears and shut their eyes to the one who was life who was standing before them, and now it is no difference. This is one of the greatest tragedies that we see in our text, that people, even though confronted by the truth, the life that Jesus had to bring, could not bring themselves to believe and instead rejected the message that Jesus had to tell them. The only message that could bring them forgiveness, the only message that could bring them eternal life, it was not about them. It was not about their self-imposed piety. It was not about how good they could live or their track record with God and the law that he had given. It was only, only about the life that he could breathe into their souls to raise them to eternal life now and forever. Do these words of Jesus sound harsh to us? Does the teaching that you and I can do nothing to bring ourselves to God make us cringe? Does it grate on our ears? There is a part of us that it does grate against. We're told in the book of Romans that the sinful mind is hostile to God. It cannot submit to his law, nor can it do so. And when Jesus is saying, your flesh counts for nothing, it's like he's taking us all the way back to the book of Genesis. All the way back to what happened in the beginning for us as the human race. With our first parents, Adam and Eve. And he shows us what true wickedness is. We may have an idea about what evil is and about wickedness is, and we can point to some people over history, and we can say, boy, those people were really evil. People like Chairman Mao, people like Adolf Hitler, people like Joseph Stalin, people like Jeffrey Dahmer, and we say, that is true evil, and true enough, that is evil. But what lies at the heart of real wickedness and real evil? It's simply this. A resistance and a rejection to God's word and his command. That's what Adam and Eve did all the way back in the garden. God gave them harmony with him. He gave them life. He gave them all good things, and they would live with him forever. And yet when the devil came along, when Eve decided to take and eat of that fruit, she had already fallen from the faith. And what was the source of true wickedness for our first parents, Adam and Eve? It was resistance, and it was rejection of the good word that God had given. That's it. It's as simple as that. And sadly, when Adam and Eve then decided to turn their backs on God, we see that mankind lost the image of God. He lost out on life. And if you go back and you read Genesis, you see the sad story, because we're then told Adam lay with his wife Eve, and they had a child and his name was Seth. And Seth was born, not in the image of God, but we're told he was born in the image of man. He was born in the image of Adam and Eve, his parents. And then we're told with every passing generation, not, and they lived forever, and they lived forever, and they lived forever, but we're told, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. From that point on, as they committed the evil of resisting and rejecting the word of God that is life, there was only sin and death that clung to us as a human race. We're also told this in scripture, all the way back in the book of Genesis, we're told that our hearts from childhood are inclined to evil. If you think about a table, 
the table slanted to one side and you put a ball on it, that ball's always going to slide down to the lowest corner. That's the image of our hearts. We have these commands of God, but we're inclined to evil, and so we just roll off into, very often, that sin and that death, all on our own, all by nature. Nature cannot save us. Paul says that we are born objects of wrath. From the very moment that you are conceived, the very moment that you have a new strand of DNA, and you are that single cell, there God has given that single cell life, but there also that life is corrupted corrupted by sin and death, from which we cannot rescue ourselves and from which we need deliverance. And this plays out all through our lives, doesn't it? If we look at Psalm 51, King David, who is an adult, even recognizes that the reason he committed adultery with Bathsheba, the reason he did it is because it goes back all the way to his conception. Many in our world think that children are innocent. Children are not born innocent. We are all born dead on arrival. We are all born without true life. And King David confirms that when he says, Surely I was sinful from birth. Not just birth, he says. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And each and every day we feel that sin and we feel that death cling to us. On our own, in our sinful natures, we cannot have hope. There is only one hope that we can possibly have, and that is found in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ alone. And thank God that he has raised you and I to new life. He came at the day of our baptisms, and he breathed that new life into us. We talk about baptism very often because Scripture says it is a washing of rebirth and renewal. We're told it's not just a ple- uh, not just washing of dirt from the body, but a pledge of a clear conscience toward God that now saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In the book of Romans, Paul says that we were once dead, but now through baptism we are buried with Christ, and now we are raised to new life with Him, but only through the Spirit that He has put in our hearts. So as children for most of us, as infants for most of us, who are responsible and who are sinful and who need a Savior, Jesus Christ comes into our heart to rule by the power of the Spirit and the power of the Word. As those words are spoken, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And for some of you, some of you came to faith, some of you were brought to faith, rather, drawn by our God later in life whether you were a young adult or a full-fledged adult, and you heard the good news that though your sins condemned you, Jesus came to bring you deliverance from that condemnation. To hear the words of Paul, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have been set free from the power of sin and death and raised to new life in your Savior, but only in Jesus and only through the Spirit that He provides because for you and I, The flesh counts for nothing. The spirit is life. And even in these verses, how does Jesus show his tremendous love? He says the flesh counts for nothing, but immediately, immediately he holds out to them the hope of eternal life when he says, the spirit gives life, the words I have spoken to you, in verse 63, they are full of spirit and life. Literally, literally Jesus says, these words are spirit and they are life. When you hear that Jesus Christ, your Savior, lived this perfect life for you, completely innocent to rescue you from your corrupted flesh, when you hear that Jesus paid the full price for your sins on the cross so that you would not be condemned forever, but instead have life forever, when you hear the good news that Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me will live even though he dies, when you look at his empty tomb and believe that 2,000 years ago he rose from the dead and now lives forever, when you hear those words, Jesus is very truly working with a living and powerful word to bring you to faith or to strengthen your faith in him. This is not empty, meaningless words. This is not just an old text that means nothing today. This is the voice of your Savior Jesus who is with us here today and ruling in heaven who comes to you to give you the words of eternal life. Each and every day we feel the weight We feel that death cling to us. But each and every day, through the words of Jesus our Savior, we're assured again and again, yes, at my life and my cross, 
through my empty tomb and my physical resurrection, you have been raised to new life, and now that is yours forever. And we look ahead. We look ahead to that day, which we hear so often about, but a real day, a real reality, when God himself will call us his people and he will wipe every tear from our eyes, when the curse of the fall into sin is completely undone, when Eden is restored in a way and God makes a new heavens and new earth and there we will live with him where there will only be life. All why? Because here and now today and every single day that God speaks to you, he is giving you spirit and he is giving you life. If you look back at the final verses, there's also something that the world wants to pull us into, and that's to fall away from Jesus simply because of peer pressure. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. The message was too hard for them. They didn't want to see the wrath of God. They didn't want to see the message of hell, that all who don't believe in Jesus will go to hell, and all who believe in him will go to heaven. That was too harsh. But now Jesus turns to the twelve. The ones he has specifically chosen to be the pillars of the church, to take his message to the world. And what do they say? They don't fall prey to peer pressure. They don't say, well, that's what the rest of the world is saying, and so we, this small band of followers, what could we possibly know? No, Peter proclaims who it is that gives him life and the only one who he can go to for truth. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And this word of eternal life that God gives us isn't just talking about this message that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world who lived and died and rose for us. This is also talking about the entire scriptures. Because all of scripture, we're told, is God-breathed. And if Jesus is God himself, and he most certainly is, then every single word of scripture is from the mouth of Jesus himself. And what the devil wants us to do is to slowly but surely give up one truth of scripture after another that doesn't seem to jive with our feelings, that doesn't seem to fit with what the world is saying. When I read that second lesson for today and I said, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Just as Christ loved the church, even when she's being unlovable, yes, Especially then, love her like Christ loved the church and be willing to give up your life for her. And when wives, you heard Paul say, wives, submit to your husbands. Freely submit to them out of love for Jesus as the church submits to Christ. Did your whole heart cry out, yes, absolutely, Lord, that's what I want to do. Or was there part of your heart, that sinful nature, that found it harsh and grating? But it's not just the teaching of men and women. We could take any teaching of scripture and what we need to realize is there's always that part of us that kicks against what God's, God is saying. That always wants to resist the truth that he speaks. You mean to tell me that the Lord's Supper isn't just symbolic? You mean to tell me that in the Lord's Supper, in the bread and wine, I receive a supernatural event? I receive the body and blood given on the cross for me? You mean to say that it's a miracle that takes place, in a way? You mean to tell me that that is the true body and blood of Jesus? That's hard to believe, and yet it's true. You mean to tell me that at the font, when a child is brought, it's not just an empty ritual, but it is really the power of God? You mean to tell me that I can't save myself with God? I have nothing to offer that the flesh counts for nothing? And on and on. But let's not be drawn away by peer pressure. Let's not be drawn away by what the world is saying. Even if everybody in your family, even if your spouse, even if your children, even if your friends turn their back on Jesus, listen to the words of the one who speaks to eternal life and never give them up because here we can rest for our souls. Here we find eternal life that can never be extinguished in the one who died and is risen for us. When the world says, how could you possibly believe? That's just too hard. May our confession be the same. When the world wants to say, hey, why don't you follow after us? And Jesus turns and says, do you want to follow too? Let our confession be the same as that of Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe 
and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Amen.